Good evening. Good evening. This is the um, May 4th um, Yellow Springs Village Council meeting. Welcome to everyone here. Um, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Wintrow. Here. Asplin. Yep. Sim. Here. Couch. Here. McQueen. Here. <laughs> also present are Village Manager Patty Bates, Assistant Village Manager Don Young, uh, Johnny Burns, who are you? Yes, Superintendent of Water and Electric. And I believe Melissa Van Zant will be here, Finance Director will be here at any moment, and Chief Hale is also present. Thank you. Um, let's see, any announcements? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Um, first of all, I wanted to uh, remind everyone to get out and vote tomorrow. There's an important issue on the ballot, which is a renewal levy for the schools, no new taxes. Um, secondly, because this happened at 11 o'clock at our last meeting, I wanted to welcome uh, Cabba Davies, who is our Antioch Miller Fellow uh, working with the village uh, for her spring co-op, and she's been doing a lot of great stuff, like filming the arrival of our international fellows. And John, I thought I'd let you do the honors of introducing Nadia and Rati. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I may have some difficulty with uh, some last names, so... <laughs> See? Because uh, that's why, that's why you... Ask them to yeah. introduce themselves. Yeah. Yes. 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 Come on up to the microphone and introduce yourselves. Right. They have come... Right here? Right there. In yes. the middle. Did we turn the microphone on? The microphone is on. Okay. So, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rati Dwira Madanti. Is it on? It is on. Yes. 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 Yep. yes. Uh, just call me Rati for short. I'm from Indonesia. And here's my another fellow. <laughs> <laughs> so, good evening, everyone. I'm Nadia Faradila Jalawi from Malaysia. Just call me Nadia. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to both of you. Thank Look like you. I was following Facebook. Looks like he had a great day yesterday. Yeah. So right the great tour of the village. Yes, and on, actually on May 28th, there's going to be a forum uh, where Nadia and Rati will present the work that they're doing. Uh, we've mentioned it a couple times, but it's a project about enhancing uh, citizen engagement, and they're going to help us with a variety of things as well as take have some takeaways, including learning about renewable energy and also about our secondary school system. So uh, welcome. Anything else? Staff? Nope. Mm -mm. Okay, so we will, um, we have a consent agenda. Um, the two items on the consent agenda, <coughs> agenda are the minutes from our April 20th regular council meeting and our March 30th uh, special joint meeting with Miami Township trustees and village council. I have a motion to accept. So move. Second. Second. All those in, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Um, and next we will be reviewing the agenda. Um, we actually did have one additional item added, resolution 2015-12. It's um, for an OWDA loan. Mm -hmm. Um, that Patty asked to be added. It's for the um, uh, loop completion project. Um, so we actually, the list of, of legislation has grown, I think, since the last meeting, since agenda planning last time. So anything else that anybody wants to add or, or move um, in the agenda? Okay. Uh, Lori, would you like to please review the petitions and communications? Okay. Um. Yeah, and I'll review all the ones that were in the electronic packet, which I think were there were more than were in the um, paper packet. So some were not listed at the top of the sheet, uh, the top of the agenda. Um, so we had a note from Kathy Adams um, regarding a NAMI uh, Ohio PTO event at Mills Lawn in recognition of children's mental health awareness this week. Uh, Mills Lawn Elementary School in NAMI, that's a mental health um, organization in Ohio We're going to be having a program called Parents and Teachers as Allies about ch child and adolescent mental health. Um, AJ Warren sent us a note about the skate park launch which will take place during street fair on June 13th. Um, we got several 
thank yous um, and supportive notes about the police chief. One from Karen Gordon, who's from out of town, but her mother lives here, and the police and the dispatch, she specifically uh, wanted to pull out the dispatch as being very helpful during a power outage when her mother was having some difficulties and the police helped. Um, Terry Graves Strider sent a thank you to Chief Hale for releasing Officer Sexton to help with a program out of the Greene County Learning Center. Um, Sue Abendroth wrote a letter um, asking people not to prejudge the police chief and expressing support for his work. Um, then we had a few, uh, a couple of letters about the utility policy, one from Bob Bingenheimer supporting the proposed policy, uh, making landlords ultimately responsible, one from Richard Donnelly um, opposing the policy and including a letter that he sent to his tenants. Um, we also had a letter from Tom Clevenger regarding the solid waste contract. Um, and uh, based on his, he worked for many years as a recycling professional for the University of Washington. And he had several um, good suggestions about the waste recycling contract and reducing our carbon footprint. I included a letter um, regarding Scouts for Equality, a proposed letter that council would sign supporting efforts to include um, gay adults as troop letters. Rachel McKinley included her um, treasurer's report noting that our interest from our accounts continues to exceed the fees, but both are pretty negligible. We get almost no investment money, but we also don't pay that much for our bank accounts. Um, she would like to go to a conference that keeps her skills up to date, um, which might let her know if there's anything else we can do to try to improve the return our on our um, on our holdings, um, she suggests participation in the open checkbook, an optional transparency initiative from the state. And uh, Jong Young um, had an ICMA release, uh, a press release about Nadia and Rati. And um, Brian and Marianne had uh, uh, the final documents for the roles and responsibilities. Um, and I believe that's not on our agenda for tonight. It'll be right. later. And uh, there was an online only notice from NAMI regarding a live event at the Middle Little Art Theater on May 14th. Squishy Man, it's a night of comedy benefiting non, uh, NAMI mental health organization with a $10 suggested donation. There was a good review from the Chicago Tribune that they excerpted there. Thanks, Lori. I, I would like to ask um, to pull out the Scouts for Equality letter so that we could, um, someone could make a motion. I'd like to ask for a motion um, that we sign and send that letter. I'll move since I wrote the, wrote up the letter. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And Judy, will you be able to prepare that on Village Letterhead and mm -hmm. bring it over? I can sign it. Yes, I will. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, oh, there was, um, the chief had asked for um, uh, an additional, uh, yeah, that'll be as part of my report. But should that be part of your report? Mm -hmm. If we're going to, do yeah. we need to make a decision? Does council need to make a decision on that? You'll need to make a decision to allow the position, yes. Is it a formal resolution kind of decision or is it a? Um, I, does it eventually have to be a resolution? to add a position? I don't but believe the so. Position, but the position you, exists. More of a I mean, the, yeah. the position description exists, The right? position description exists. And that's my understanding that that's all council has to vote on. Uh, I was told you had to actually add the position because this position is not currently one of the ones that we, it's an additional person. No, I mean, my understanding is that we, we only vote on positions on actual so that if you were creating a new position in the PD then we would have to vote on it if the fact that part-time dispatcher is a, is a position mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then we don't yeah that I don't think we've ever voted on anything like on this before. Right. I mean I think this is a budget decision. especially since it's it's basically as I understand it just replacing right it, it's hours taking that are hours be, yes that are going to be lost Correct. due to Right. Um, due to uh, experiences that yes. other people are having, yes. we, there's going to be a shortfall in hours, and this is to make up for that. Correct. We certainly don't vote every summer to hire part-time workers for the parks crew. Mm -hmm. You know, 
Um, so right. I don't, I, I think Karen's right. All right. Maybe. And, it, and, it, and again, it's, it's not uh, any increase in the budget, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. We've got one thing resolved. Yay. Hmm. Um, uh, moving on to public hearings and legislation. Uh, first, on, first item is second reading and public hearing of Ordinance 2015-05, amending Section 1272.04 of the Codified Ordinances of Yellow Springs, Ohio, to increase permit fees. Um, I think we can just read this by title only, which I just did, but Judy, just repeat it. But, and then we'll have John explain it to us. Okay, do so you want it reread? Just reread it, yeah. <laughs> it's official when it comes from you. <laughs> Job security. <laughs> yeah, really. Extending old section 1272.04 of the Yellow Springs Zoning Code and adopting new section 1272.04 of the Yellow Springs Zoning Code and adopting Appendix A to the Yellow Springs Zoning Code, establishing permit fees. Thank you. Uh, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. John, would you please explain uh, what's being proposed? Sure. Um, as I, uh, we, we explained uh, last meeting, uh, we, our permit fees have not been raised since 1993. Um, so we're going and basically uh, looking at how um, basically the applications would be at cost for, uh, for, for going to the Planning Commission or the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, so those costs have increased obviously since 1993. Um, so we looked at what our finances were and also what other ordinances across uh, the state of Ohio and in Kentucky have, um, and also wanted to stay competitive with adjacent municipalities. So our rates have gone up a little bit for general permits, such as a fence or an accessory structure. Uh, that will go from $10 to $15. Uh, and then uh, we'll have a new construction fee for new single family homes. That will be $35. If you're building a multifamily building or commercial uh, retail space uh, that's over 5,000 square feet or over four residential units, it's $35 plus $10 per every unit over four or every 1,000 square feet over 5,000. Um, PUD developments for planned unit developments, application fee goes up from uh, $75 to $150. Um, the level B plan review includes, uh, goes to, up to $100 with a $500 refundable deposit that would help cover engineering costs that the village may incur. Um, conditional, application, conditional use applications go from $35 to $100. Uh, lot subdivisions um, are now $50 and also include a $15 per uh, additional lot. Map and text amendment uh, requests are now $200, uh, up from $100. Uh, the variance applications to Board of Zoning Appeal are $100. Uh, they used to be $35, and also the same thing for administrative appeal. Um, the compliance certificate also went from 10 to 15. Um, appealing to the planning uh, to village council from the planning commission or board of uh, zoning appeals is now $100, and you will get uh, $30 refunded if your appeal is refirmed. Additionally, right of way vacation requests are now $50 if the petition is if there are petitions included per section 1224.03a and it's $100 if there's $100 if there's no petition and then finally if you are caught with doing erecting a structure without a zoning permit uh, there's a fine which is 50% of the of the uh, permit fee cost that will be attached to the permit when you get it uh, so that is basically a general rundown of the in fee increases the Planning Commission voted to recommend approval of the fee increases at their April uh, plan meeting, and uh, the, the ordinance was advanced as first reading last council meeting. You guys have any questions? It, it, are the actual fees part of the zoning code? So the fees are adopted. Uh, in, are you asking about what's what's in legislation? Well, I'm just I'm trying to, to figure out when, when where people will see this and it will to be make sure the, all the documents get updated. That's correct. It will be part of the zoning code. It will be attached to the back as Appendix A. Okay. Any other comments or questions from council? This is the second reading and a public hearing, so I'll open the floor to comments from citizens. Questions? Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council. Uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? 
Yes. Pouch. Yes. Sims. Yes. Askland. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Wintrow. Yes. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is second of three readings of Ordinance 2015-06. Do you want this by title? Um, yes, just by title. Okay, this is rescinding old sections 1040.02 through 1040.04, 1040.08, and 1040.99 of the Yellow Springs Code of Ordinances, and adopting new sections 1040.02 through 1040.04, 1040.08, and 1040.99 of the Yellow Springs Code of Ordinances. Okay, um, will we have you summarize what the changes are? <laughs> yes. Um, one change that we made was to the procedure that um, Melissa presented. Um, after we started talking about it, um, this will apply only to leases let to new tenants. It will not apply when you renew a lease. Um, there were a couple of reasons for that. Uh, primarily, we don't have the personnel to keep track of it, and it alleviates you of the responsibility, you as the landlord, of the responsibility of uh, worrying about that until you actually put a new tenant in your space, your rental space. So we did um, we did change that. Um, that was it, wasn't it? Well, that was the only change to the and that was to the procedure. And I would like to explain a couple of things. Um, first of all, all of the all of the procedures that Melissa outlined have been in place and operational for some time with the exception of this piece of legislation that we're talking about um, tonight, the, the responsibility piece. Um, the other procedures where she's tightened up the, um, the payment plans and we've changed a couple of other things, all of those have been in, are in place and have been in place for some time, so we've already um, realized the the benefit of those as far as what they're going to do to to lower the delinquency um, and I also you should have found in your packets a recap of um, a survey that we did of uh, AMP communities that provide an electric utility um, roughly 62% uh, of them hold the property owner responsible for the utilities, including electric. Um, out of that 62%, only two of the entities separate the electric out as something other than water and sewer. <clears throat> and uh, across the board, whether they hold the property owner responsible or the tenant responsible, commercial and residential properties are treated exactly the same. There was no difference between the two. That was, those were questions that had come up at the last meeting that council asked us to do the survey on. Mm -hmm. um, what am I forgetting? I'm forgetting something. What about the ten ordinance are separate? Uh, that's it. The procedures and the ordinance are two separate things. The ordinance is strictly that change in that one section um, that um, eliminates the. Um, deposits mm -hmm. and and makes the property owner responsible the procedure is entirely different it's a living breathing document we can change it we can tweak it if we come find there are problems with it something's not working we can change the procedure as we go along it's not something that's set in stone so patty uh, what about um with uh, having the utilities and the tenant or the landlord name, did, did you make a change in that? It, we, ha we had that in the last time. It, it can be in either one's name. It'll be up to the landlord. Um, it can be in the tenant's name, and that does allow the tenant to still be eligible for um, assistance programs like HEAP. Um, but that will be the landlord's choice, whether they want it in their name or the tenant's name. And, and is, is the process that a, a um, there will have both names, either way, both names will, will be al on Although I guess if the, if the landlords decide to keep it completely in their name. We still need the tenants. You still need, okay. We, we still need the tenants information um, for Rita. Okay. So. Thanks. Um, Chris, would you like to speak to the legislation itself? Um, maybe mention the utility dispute 
resolution board um, and how that would operate. Good evening, Chris Connor, the village solicitor. Um, fundamentally, the ordinance is the framework by which the, the law exists, but the operations are done by the dispute utility board, which the, we've had, the, the ordinance has already existed where it's created. Uh, it's made up of the village manager, the finance director, and then one person, I think, appointed from the village. Um, and that will be the body that, that is responsible for the implementation of the ordinance. Um, since this is a change, there could be some, some unusual situations that need to be addressed. That body would have the authority uh, to act quickly to resolve those issues. It would not necessarily have to come back to council. Um, and the idea is that that would be the, the place where citizens would go to uh, express their concerns or if there were some issue that were to develop over the, the billing process and, and how it worked. Okay. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, and I think that if anybody has any questions, if they, they read uh, the ordinance, it explains what the rules are. The uh, board has, interestingly, and I think this is important to know, that the dispute utility board has the ability to pass policy that has the effect of a resolution as if council had done it. Okay. Um, council, how do we want to proceed? Do you have, first of all, I guess, do you have any questions for Chris? Do you have any questions for staff? Um, are we ready to hear from citizens? I had one question. Okay. In, in terms of, of the, uh, the landlord, they, they would have the same, and I don't know if I should direct it to Melissa or to Patty, but they would have the ability <coughs> to set up payments if the account got the link. Yes. If it's in their name, yeah. If it's in their name. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, the, the idea here, I mean, again, the, the, the dispute utility board is there to create the policy, then the implementation of the day-to-day -day still rests with the utility department. Thank you. So um, this is our second reading. We're having three readings. The third reading will be the public hearing. Um, so that will be when we will have um, a full hearing of, of all public comments. Um, I would, you know, we've we've. I would like to keep things as brief as possible. I'd like to keep the move the meeting moving along. Um, I'd like to hear. I think we'd like to hear new points, new concerns, especially um, if you have them. So um, I will open the floor and and also just come up to the microphone, state your name, and um, you are limited to three minutes in your comments. And we will hear new comments, hear from new people before we hear repeats. Yes. If, Michael Kreitzer, if I could just ask for a clarification, clarification, pardon me, of the question that Mr. Sims asked. With regard to payment plans, if the account is in the landlord's name mm -hmm. but sent to the tenant, mm -hmm. it is the landlord that chooses whether or not a payment plan is enacted or the tenant. The account is in the landlord's name. It's in, if it's in the landlord's name, then the landlord chooses. But if it's in the landlord's name, you should keep, be aware that your uh, tenant would not be eligible for some of the assistance programs. Understood, and you've, you've made that clear. But it is the landlord's response, it is the landlord's authority to agree or not agree to a payment plan. If it's in, your, if it's in the landlord's, it's whoever Th the name of the account is in. Thank you. Okay. Who would anybody else for comments? Dean, you're just jumping up, I know. <laughs> Dino Pilata. First off, I want to apologize to you, Lori. Oh, no. For some miscommunications, <laughs> but I need to be put out there. And I want to thank everybody that I met with this week for taking the time to meet with me. I appreciate it. Um, just a couple questions, and we can answer them when we answer them at your, at your leisure. Uh, council, as part, you listen to the experts from your staff to come up with their answers for you. We also are experts on our side of the business, and we ask that you open up and listen to us, what we have to bring, too. Um, staff, I guess I have the question for staff that you've provided data, you've collected data, you provided it. If you could share it with us, what, when this resolution is passed in other communities, what have you found? 
how has it, how has it been effective? Has it been effective? Does it work from a business development side and from a tenant side mm -hmm. with with respect to lower income uh, <coughs> housing? That's a that's a concern that I was looking at. Um, secondly, again, bringing it up to you guys, another uh, another issue that I was looking at as far as compromising on this entire resolution. Would we be possibly looking at breaking this out? Landlords take care of the water, water and sewer, while the village is still responsible for the electric and breaking it out in that respect. I know we've looked at the AMP communities, City of Hamilton, for example, as you guys brought up last week, or we looked, we've looked at the City of Hamilton, we've got an email from them stating that they don't build landlords, they build directly to the tenants. We know it can be broken out, that's what I'm asking, is if, if we can share this work, looking at sharing the responsibility of this policy. Um, we're all, we all have the work. Obviously, there's work being passed along on this. Can we share it? In that respect, we take the, you know, landlords are gonna take the water sewer, and then you guys are responsible for the, for the electricity. But in, in doing so, I think it frees up you guys, the, the, your staff, as far as not doing everything, we can, work through it we can work through our side of it to keep it going and we could also you're able to work more so directly on an electrical issue when those issues come up i think that's pretty much uh that's pretty much what i've got thanks thanks dino okay. anyone else just me, just me. I hi joe you know. I'm <laughs> joe Dunby. and hi, joe. i was just wondering why we can't wait until the new meters are in so we can experiment with that part first instead of throwing everything in new meters and everything at once and not knowing where the problem lies because we don't know where the problem lies do we know we're, we're not sure on the billing a lot of people come in and say i have two bills the same amount of usage and the amount of money is different so we don't know what's going on but if why why wouldn't we be able to wait until the new meters are in does anybody yeah. have a well, comment? Well, we'll address things okay. at the we end. Are, we'll try Thank to write you. things okay. down. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Um, anyone else? Okay, well, let's answer that question. Who would be the appropriate person? You? Well, um, the question that Dino asked as far as does it work with regard to lower income tenants, I did ask that of the AMP communities as I was kind of polling them. And for the most part, they said that they didn't see any real impact when it switched over. Um, I specifically asked that question of um, Athens, Ohio, which is a huge rental town, obviously. And um, they said they had seen no adverse, they were aware of no adverse impact. So, I mean, it, would that be readily apparent? It's difficult to say. Um, as far as breaking out the bill, the problem with breaking out the bill is that it would cause us to send two bills for every account because we'd have to send a separate electric bill. We'd have to have a separate account for the electric bills and then we'd have to have an account for the water and sewer because and, and sending out the two bills would probably negate the cost savings that we're gonna, we would you know, realize from, mm -hmm. from what we're doing. Um, and waiting until the meters are in, that's, that's a council call. Um, is, you know. is, there, is there a logic? I mean, that's what I would be interested well, in knowing. I, what Ms. Dunphy um, referred to is that there have been some, some questions about some of the billing, and, and in fact, Teresa and I have been emailing about it. We have the information. Melissa and I are going to look into it and set up a meeting maybe for later this week or the first of next week so that we can explain how that works and why it looks wrong on your bill. But any, everyone needs to understand that if you get a bill that you do not believe is right or you don't understand, please bring it to the utility office. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to explain it to you over the phone, but they can print out the history and show you right there on the page, um, but it, it is very confusing if you're not standing there with little visual aids in your hand. So um, if you get a bill that you dispute or that you don't think is right or that seems to be in error, please um, come down there. If you can't come down, please feel free to email it 
to Melissa, scan it in and email it to Melissa and she will get back with you with an explanation. Melissa, could, Melissa, can you address, ask, I have a question for you, can you? Well, and maybe um, you can speak to um, uh, Joe Dunphy's question about basically what the problems are that this solves. Does that make sense? Like, because she was, she's asking, you know, if all the tightening and, we, and getting the new meters might solve the problems, then is there really a problem in a way that this specific policy will solve? Could you talk a little bit yeah. about how you see this policy as solving a real problem that you actually face in the office? Basically, the meters are solving uh, completely, both of those pieces are, are, are um, kind of dealing with two totally separate issues. The meter issue um, is dealing with remedying so many old meters in town that we are finding we are having issues with. Um, some mm -hmm. of them have remotes installed on them, and the remotes might be faulty and give us um, an inaccurate read. And if they are in a place where our staff isn't able to get in to be able to look at the meter with their own two eyes, it can cause a number of issues until it's detected in the billing, um, which Denise is constantly flagging things, trying to figure out if there's any issues, if there's any inconsistencies. She looks at trends over a number of months to try to identify that. So the meter issue is really aging infrastructure and accuracy is huge on that because the, um, the amount of money that we could be losing based on those faulty meters is a totally separate issue from this um, because we haven't been able to get accurate reads so we can only go by what we have. So trying to capture a dollar amount and put it on that is really hard to do because, I mean, we're getting new meters so we're gonna be able to at least kind of benchmark that looking at the revenues and the reads that we're collecting now versus the new after the new meters are implemented. And, and just to recap, which meters are we replacing? The electric, electric. which is huge because it's going to allow us to read the water on a monthly basis. Looking at a bill, um, which is the second part, well, part of that question that was raised is why are the bills different? And there are a number of different reasons as to why the bills could be different. Um, one neighbor could have an account that starts with three one, number, one neighbor could have one that starts with one, and that all depends on when the reading is. Um, our meter readers have actually had to back up into the previous months at times to read. So once the billing is turned around, somebody could be read on the 28th of the month prior, so the 28th of January, and then their neighbor might not be read because of the way that the routes are structured. If they're going the op they start here and they're going the opposite direction, they might not be read until February 12th. So um, the routes have been redone to be um, a, a little bit more um, efficient. Yeah, efficient. Thank you. So they have been redone, but it could still cause gaps. And we've had a rate increase with the sewer, and that causes a number of issues depending on the date that you're read. That can that can play a factor um, with the quarterly billing. That just causes a number of issues as well because there's a catch up, and it's the rate increase it might they might only be paying for a rate increase for a month and like four days versus the number the neighbor might be paying uh, the rate increase for a month and 15 days it's okay. there's a number of issues so right. with the policy part of it like you were asking the second part of that question that's just basically tightening up things and putting them in solid written policy that we can fall back on it had been very loose in terms of allowing people to have extensions um, past the disconnection dates um, payment plans were not really uh, solidified and put into writing as to how we were doing those. Those types of things were allowing some of the customers to have bills that should have been larger than normal. And we were trying to be accommodating to the, re to the tenant or the resident and um, that was causing some of the bills to, to kind of swell. Not largely, but I mean, every little bit was going to help in this. So just tightening up the policies, we're just trying to make sure that people were getting bills that they that were going to be manageable and not letting them get out of hand. So we've been doing that for quite a bit now. Right, but the utility policy making it the, the landlord's responsibility 
that's addressing exactly. that's addressing the piece where we do have um, a lot of tenants that are leaving town with balances on their bills. So that's a totally separate issue that this is addressing. Can you tell a little bit about how that will address it? That as far as assessing it and eventually getting it back. Yeah. Um, if if a I mean, we just had it happen just this week in one of the apartments. We disconnected um, somebody, and we've got, you know, a pile of letters of people that have been disconnected awaiting them to call and get their electric turned back on, and there was an issue at one of the apartment complexes in an apartment that was two doors down, and we found that when uh, the staff went out there that the person that was disconnected just a day before had already left. So what would happen in that case is the landlord would be notified well before the disconnection date with these new policies and procedures. So the chances of what the, the procedure was of the landlord getting the letter after it's turned off will, will be gone. So basically, um, once somebody is disconnected and the payment needs to be made, and if it's not paid, then we turn it over to the Greene County Auditor. It'll eventually be assessed with the property taxes and it will be collected in the first and the second half of the following year. And I would also like to point out one thing, the new meters are likely to actually exacerbate the problem because they will read more accurately. I mean, there's a, a, a lot of loss in all of our meters right now because they're aging infrastructure, so. I have a question about the meters. It, could, could a landlord make a choice to only have a single meter, say they have a two or a four unit property, if with this policy could they decide, hey, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna meter separately, I'm gonna meter only, I'm gonna meter. <laughs> that, they could, but they have to go through the Green County and get it all redone. Okay, re so that's not an that easy be, thing. Okay, be thank you. Anything else for Melissa? Um, anything else for Melissa, Council? Okay. Don't go far. Okay. <laughs> okay, one more comment okay. from Joe. When you say that if people come to the utility office and ask for an explanation of their bill, mm -hmm. that's not true. That I mean, there's been a lot of people that have walked into that office and said, explain this bill to me. I've sold a house, and for four months, after the new buyer signed up and he paid his final bill, then he got more bills and more. He came down. That's just the way they are. That was the answer. They never explained to that person why he had to pay for four months more. So the, the explanation is not there. If somebody can tell me, I, that's what I'd like to know. I'd like for them to be able to say, one, two, three. These are the rules. This is how it goes so many gallons or fifty dollars or whatever no matter who buys those gallons everybody's equal it's just that way just okay. like buying a pound of candy okay thanks you Joe. want to pay the same price mm -hmm. um council um do any well i have a, it's comments, a procedural questions? question mm -hmm. i guess we're going to vote this time and then we have another vote right um, it's the la is it the last vote that counts? Yes. So yes. like some, mm -hmm. it could go down this one and go up the next one. Yeah. It's yeah. the last. A lot of councils don't even um, vote until the on last their one. until the last oh, reading. Okay. So we choose to just as a, as a you know for transparency purposes. The, and the reason why I'm asking is because this has been a long, drawn out, contentious, <laughs> complex issue and um, it I don't want to I mean I'm happy to talk about it and you know what I think and everything but I don't want to keep doing it at each meeting right so. I'm I'm kind of thinking that myself you know I I think so I mean what what is everybody else thinking are we are we ready to vote do people want to make comments are we ready to or just ready to have Judy call the roll for me call the roll <coughs> Well, I, I am right now, I'm one of these, this has been a very hard one for me. Um, and I'm still talking to people and getting information and I want people to realize that I am listening and I haven't like 
set my heart in one direction and 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 that's where I'm going I'm really trying to respond to evidence as I get it um, my major concerns last time were about commercial properties and also about um, uh, low-income people I spoke to commercial renters and to a few people including um, Linda Rudowski who gave me permission to share her email she's worked on helping uh, vulnerable populations low-income mentally ill people avoid homelessness um, I believe in Champaign and Logan counties mm -hmm. I wrote that mm -hmm. with yes yes mm -hmm. um, for many years and um, she her position was to support the policy and she has uh, uh, many ideas about things that can support low-income people I do her impression and my impression from also reading the Ohio PUCO the Public Utility <coughs> Commission is that um, even heap it says heap is for PUCO regulated utilities as a municipal utility I don't think we're a PUCO regulated so I think we might want to double check that but my so my understanding is that there is no um, no programs that they would be effectively denied if the if the utility is in the landlord name and there are things that uh, property owners can do like weatherization programs are um, are available that can be done through the tenant's name even if they don't have it in the tenant's name but the, if the tenant is low income their low income status can be used to weatherize a home that they're renting even if they're not um, the owner of that home so those kinds of things <coughs> have pushed me back over the line to supporting this policy I wanted to explain my change but also say I am I'm still listening and that I do hear the concerns I also spoke to Judith Hempfling she opposes the policy I've obviously been very close to Judith for many years and her stories um, you know definitely gave me some pause so I I'll just be honest with you that I'm sort of right at this this uh, this borderline but I feel um, right now I'm supporting I'm supporting the policy um, oh, um yeah I'll, I'll just say a okay. few things um, uh, at this point I am supporting the policy um, and I would like to uh, see a, a the possibility of setting up a local fund and uh, Chrissy Cruz has mentioned this uh, and have HRC look into the possibility of having some kind of um, fund for low-income tenants that's uh, administered locally for local people um, I don't know whether there's uh, some kind of risk management fund that could be available for uh, commercial properties in particular through like our revolving loan fund or something um, I both those kind of funds I'd rather see <coughs> separate separated out of our utilities I don't think that it makes sense for our utilities to absorb losses uh, for non-payment of utilities because we are a gov small government <coughs> municipally owned fund uh, in terms of how this may or may not impact uh, affordable <coughs> rental I think the main thing is we need more affordable rental housing we need more rental housing and I am going to ask that uh, council start looking at develop at looking at a plan for the glass farm in particular because that's land that we owned it also if we were to develop part of it that would bring in more income uh, <coughs> for the village uh, not only because of residents or commercial uh, uh, properties that might be located there but also selling the land for that purpose so I think that the main thing about affordability is that we need more rental housing and we need more affordable rental housing so I think those are oh the other thing is as this if and as this goes into place I assume landlords will be letting the village know if there are problems and I also want the village to be tracking and seeing how this is work so it's working so uh, you know keeping track of things and you know if mm -hmm. if there are problems then we need to deal with them 
And to segue from that, I, I have felt confident in this process that our village team members are doing that, that they are looking at this holistically, responding to feedback. Could we have started the process better? Maybe. But in terms of where we are now, I think it's been really discussed well, and, and uh, I'm more and more confident with uh, how the policy is shaping up. Um, <clears throat> I guess I, I feel I should talk about four points. Um, I have a lot of conversations, uh, and honestly, the feedback I've been hearing is pretty evenly split on supporting or not supporting. Um, but I guess one issue that I feel is important to a lot of people that's been discussed is the fairness issue. And um, I feel like ultimately when uh, I look at this decision between uh, do we make everyone in the village responsible for the delinquencies or do we make uh, a smaller group uh, as it's been articulated by Sam, um, it feels to me from my conversations that most citizens feel that it should be the responsibility of the landlord, that it should not be spread across the village. So that's one thing that uh, is in my mind and kind of informing my decision. Um, I think that uh, the point about waiting is persuasive, but there's also a side of this which is letting people know what we're gonna do, not saying, okay, we may or may not do it in six months, but making uh, in all these changes a clear policy so that um, new landlords understand what to expect. I've also felt that um, in this process, and especially what I heard tonight from Patty and, and Melissa, that we are doing a gentle implementation. Um, it's not every new lease. That, that bothered me initially, but that we're looking at, uh, or not, not the renewed lease is what I meant to say, right. but that we are looking at as new tenants come in, those expectations can be set up. Because a lot of the uh, criticism of the policy has been related to what am I going to do when my tenant's lease expires in July. And I, and I felt for that, I think we've uh, adapted to that and made it a smoother, gentler transition. Um, the third thing I wanted to mention is related to the affordability issue, because this has been talked about a lot. And I mean, Linda Rudolsky's letter is very compelling because she is in the business of doing this. But even before seeing that, I, I feel that um, if landlords care about affordability, then they can work with their tenants and they can work with the village to ensure that. And Karen's brought up great points about um, are there situations where we can uh, uh, upgrade the um, uh, equipment um, so that we have lower utility bills in some of the places that we're renting, so that affects affordability. Uh, I do think this encourages that. The other thing that I think about is the fact that, um, again, based on that relationship, if we want to make sure that tenants can access PIP for Vectrin or HEAP, maybe not, um, the relationship can be set up that way. And I think Melissa's done a good job of keeping it um, flexible in that regard. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is um, most of what I've heard in terms of criticisms has been uh, cherry picking one piece that somebody doesn't like and not looking at the overall policy. And I think this has taken a while to absorb, but at this point, I think we've gotten to a point where it is really clear. I agree with Melissa that issues about rates and metering are separate, so I'm not going to get clouded by that. But I do believe that we've gotten to the point where um, we're going to keep on listening to what the public says. We're going to tweak the procedure and policy, but we've got something fixed and in place, and I think that it's going to work. Um, so those are my four issues. I'm also, like Lori, still thinking and listening. The, uh, <clears throat> the only other concern I have, and I've listened to uh, suggestions and so forth from the community, and that had to do with the implementation. I knew at one point we had talked about it would take effect uh, January, January, January 1 of 2016, but I see that that, that, that is, has been stricken from the latest version. Am I reading that correctly? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And, and I personally would, would like to see that put back in 
that would go if, go in effect one January, and that does give both us and the landlords to, from from our point, you know, uh, to to really uh, look at our at our process. Uh, we we are going to be shortly adding a new person that's going to be coming in to um, help with utilities if that person has been has not been added yet but it also gives the landlords a chance to to kind of look at their tenants and also look at the tenants that they have been accustomed to running to and since the deposit now <coughs> is going to fall really back on the the, the uh, the landlord in terms of what I need to do to possibly cover my now new exposure. Uh, this is what made, they'd have about six months to, to, to kind of look at that and be ready to, to jump off and run with it as we are going to, going to be doing. Uh, you know, everybody needs some time when you implement a new, a new policy and I forget who made that suggestion, but I thought that that was a good suggestion too. You want to make a uh, motion to amend the ordinance? Yeah, I'd like to amend the, the you know, to amend the, the ordinance to have the uh, implementation start 1 January of 2016. Can, and then with, yeah. I, can I just point yeah. out that I, I, we can certainly do that, and I'm not saying we can't, mm. but this it's going to take a long time to implement this anyway as far as at, since it's not going to apply to renewals and only when they lease to a new person it's going to take years yeah. to implement this just so yeah. i mean yeah. we can certainly change the date to the to the january yeah. one date if that's what council wants but if they've got a if they've got a place opening up for the from the landlord side it it would take a place it would that, take a bit that's it true. Would take effect yes. immediately, and they don't have the time to think it through. Yeah. So I will second your motion, so that it can be discussed. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'd like to hear staff reaction, Melissa. I mean, does that have an impact on staff on you? Council, what is council thinking of? I mean, I, I would. I, I think I'm just inclined to to want to stick with the the time schedule that's been proposed that's in the legislation, but I'm willing to support either either one. Um, it would be okay with me to do the January. Brian, I support it. Sort of uh, goodwill gesture, maybe. When Joe Dunphy mentioned that at our last meeting, I was persuaded by it as well. So uh, yeah, I support that uh, amendment. Okay, so do we, can we, do we have to do a, you Roll can. call, can we do a voice vote on the amendment? I think we do a voice vote on the amendment. Okay. We're still have right. right. Yeah. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Um, um, I did want to say one more thing. I, you know, everything that's been said, I agree with. The other piece that I have been talking about is the whole issue of energy efficiency and um, the, the fact that um, investment in these houses will help or, and, and buildings, uh, commercial properties and residential properties will help. It was mentioned in the client, by the Climate Action Group, by the Environmental Commission. That was a huge piece. So I would like to, um, I, I would like to just kind of open up an idea for the Energy Board to really start to look at, at some kind of an energy efficiency program. Perhaps we could take some of the proceeds that we will be getting from this change in policy and put it into a program to incentivize property owners to do energy improvements. The state has low interest programs. Um, I'm, sh you know, and maybe there's even a way that we can put together some kind of a program that will benefit our local contractors. Um, so I would like energy efficiency, not directly tied to this legislation, but I would like energy efficiency to become um, a priority you know, starting with the energy board since they're the experts. Um, and I think that that fits right into, into our sustainability goals and values. Um, so are we ready to take a vote? Yeah. Judy, please call the roll. I, I do have one question before you do that. Were there any nays? Pardon? On your last? No, on your no. Motion? Okay. 
Yes. Houch. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Winter. Yes. Okay, next we have um, the first reading of Ordinance 2015-07, accepting Planning Commission's recommendation to rezone 104 Xenia Avenue. And you want it title only. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this is an ordinance rezoning 104 North Xenia Avenue. Look uh, located in the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, for Factory 87, with C conservation with gateway overlay district to B1 central business with gateway overlay. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, John, would you please explain this legislation? So we discovered an error in the zoning map. I think it's the best explanation. If you look at the map uh, provided in the, the, the staff report, uh, the downtown viewpoint shows that uh, it looks like when the zoning map was put into a uh, effect, uh, the parcel where Peaches is located was mistakenly zoned the same zone as the Little Miami bike trail and the train station. And it, it's easy to kind of see this when you look at the map uh, because the roads are put in a very, very odd configuration here and they're not actually accurate to what is normally on our GIS system. Uh, so. Uh, we discovered that and initiated the rezoning process with uh, the Village Planning Commission. Uh, that went before the Planning Commission in uh, April. Uh, the Planning Commission found that the rezoning was consistent with the goals, policies, and future land use map of uh, the Village Yellow Springs Conference Development Plan and the Vision Yellow Springs and Miami Township document. Uh, that, that the rezoning is compatible with the site's physical, geological, hydrological, and other environmental features that is compatible with surrounding uses in terms of land sustainability, impacts in the community, density, potential influence on property values and traffic impacts that uh, the rezoning can be accommodated on subject property considering existing or planned infrastructure including road, sanitary, sewer, storm sewer, water, sidewalks, and road lighting, and uh, it, does not also, it also does not result in a spot zoning. So what we're doing is uh, we're rezoning the, the property from a park to a commercial business that's consistent with the rest of the downtown. Uh, we're maintaining the gateway overlay district on it, which I believe was uh, an intentional implementation of the uh, zoning map amendment. And the Planning Commission voted in their April meeting to approve this uh, and forward it on to Village Council for their approval and decision as well. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions from citizens? This is the first reading. We'll have a second reading at the next meeting and a public hearing. Uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Askin? Yes. Sims? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Uh, next we have first reading of Ordinance 2015-09. Whole shebang? It's all title? just by title. Okay. This is Ordinance 2015-09, amending Section 1042.01 of the Code of Ordinances with respect to the determination of the power supply cost adjustment. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Patty, <laughs> this is yours. Um, right now we have a, a power supply cost adjustment every month on the bill, and it is based on a rolling 12-month um, period. So it changes every month, but it's based on 12 months all the time. And as John Courtney um, presented uh, last week during the, the rate study, um, he, this is going to, it, it, it ends up costing us money. We lose money. Um, so his recommendation is to make that power cost adjustment based on a three month average so that you realize it uh, in a more timely manner. Um, to when it was actually incurred. And um, this is important that we do this quickly because as we move forward in time and our power costs start going up as the hydro projects go online, that gap between the power cost adjustment and the revenue was just going to get bigger and bigger uh, because of the rolling 12-month period. Now it will be, if we do it on three months, it will be uh, realized in a much closer proximity to when it was actually incurred. Okay. Questions, comments from council? Questions, comments from citizens? Again, this is the first reading. We will have a public hearing at the next meeting. 
Seeing and hearing none, uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Askland? Yes. Sims? Yes. McQueen? Yes. House? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, next, we have reading of resolution 2015-17, supporting the purchase by Glen Helen Association of real estate known as the David A. Case Trust property. Um, could you read this one? I'd like just citizens to hear this. Yes. Whereas council has received a request from the Glen Helen Association for support of their application to the State of Ohio Public Works Commission for purchase of 46.69 acres of land located at 1265 State Route 343. And whereas the Yellow Springs Village Council has reviewed this request for support of the application and has determined that conservation of the David A. Case Trust property is important to the long-range goals of the Village of Yellow Springs regarding protection of our water supply. And whereas the David A. Case Trust property is a core parcel within the country common and conservation of this property would provide a buffer of land to the east of the village, and whereas council finds the request for, for real estate purchase acceptable for achieving the desired outcome of the conservation of the David A. Case Trust property, and whereas Glen Helen Association wishes to participate and commits to finance no less than 25% of the purchase price, now therefore the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, Council hereby supports the request for purchase of the David A. Case Trust property by the Glen Helen Association. Section 2, Council hereby certifies that conservation of the David A. Case Trust property is in accordance with village goals regarding protection of the village water supply and conservation of open space for the Village of Yellow Springs. Thank you. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Um, I see that Nick Budis is here somewhere. Hi. Hi. Um, can you speak sure. to this? Um, Nick Budis, representing Glen Helen Association today. Uh, this is a, um, a generational opportunity for us to uh, uh, add a piece of property to the Glen that was a former dairy farm and was uh, extraordinarily well stewarded by uh, David and Barbara Case for for nearly 50 years. Uh, it, uh, it represents uh, uh, the watershed of two of the largest tributaries coming into Birch Creek, uh, just upstream of where Birch Creek goes over the Cascades waterfall. Uh, and it is, as um, um, Judy mentioned, a, a core piece that's been designated part of the, the country commons uh, since the 1960, representing the, the large triangle between Yellow Springs and Clifton and the south end of Glen Helen. As, as areas that are regionally important for conserving what we think of uh, the Glen Helen ecosystem. So we're, we're thrilled to have the opportunity to work with uh, David and Barbara's family to, to acquire the parcel. We'll be uh, bringing the dollars to the table to make that happen. And part of our success in achieving that is, is your support in terms of a, of a letter. Thank you. Uh, actually, it's a resolution. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, any right. questions or comments from citizens? But I suppose just to be clear for the uh, the taxpayers present, this isn't actually involve any village money. It's purely uh, we do not an seek any village contribution for this. Uh, and this is for for support for presentation to Clean Ohio. I assume that's is exactly right. Okay. Thank so. you. And I'm sure though that the Glen would be happy for contributions from citizens directly the uh, again as the resolution uh, pointed out there'll be a component of the purchase that's financed by Glen Helen Association dollars and everyone who's a member of the association plays a role in that success okay. right thanks Nick yeah, so great. anybody who wants to write a check out and hand it to you <laughs> you would accept it <laughs> okay and um, all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. Uh, next item on the agenda is resolution 2015-12. Judy, just read this by title only and we'll have Patty explain it. Okay. This is authorizing a cooperative agreement for installation of the water loop completion project between the, village of, between the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio and the Ohio Water Development Authority. Um, um, can I have a motion? So move. Second. Okay. Um, as council should recall, we discussed um, I think earlier this year about applying for a loan through the OWDA to reimburse us for our portion of the loop completion project so that we could put that money back into the general fund, uh, which is where we appropriated it from in the first place. This resolution is just a necessary step in applying for that loan. Okay. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Questions, comments from citizens? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Uh, now is the time in the agenda where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. 
Um, each citizen would have three minutes, up to three minutes, and we ask that you come to the podium and uh, state your name, and uh, we welcome any comments. Seeing and hearing none, we'll bring it back to council table. Uh, next item on the agenda, and my gosh, we are way ahead of schedule. I love that. <laughs> Next item on the agenda <laughs> under new business is the ACE Task Force discussion proposal, and that has been uh, presented by Brian Pausch and Marianne McQueen. Yes, yeah, so um, I had initially uh, requested that council uh, have a discussion about the ACE Task Force, but um, over the last week, as I have been um, reading the articles in the Yellow Springs News, um, listening to things coming out nationally and I guess at the UN level and at the state level, there was a state task force on police. Um, I just started to think that it probably made sense for, for us to stay, step back one step further and respond to um, the information that we've been getting from our community and to acknowledge that while on the one hand Yellow Springs is a qu quite a safe place, we are impacted both thinking-wise and in, in other ways by what's happening nationally. And um, so I, I felt that it was appropriate that council really respond to the community and have a conversation about how we what, what we want the police department to be in the, to the extent that we can do that. And, and there are some things uh, that we can't have a say in, obviously. Um, and I also just, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, Kent Bristol has always said, one thing about government is that government has the power to force people to do things. <laughs> we, and, and for government and for our village, that rests largely with the police. There is this power that we, that, and, and there's always going to be a um, tension about that. On the one hand, we're happy to be uh, safeguarded, and on the other hand, uh, no one likes to be forced to do anything. So there's always a tension, and ever since I've lived here, there's been a tension about the police. But now it just seems to me that it's time that we actually have a conversation. And this is a, not about any one person. This is just about, I think, we, I think it's time. So how that would look, I can't say. And Brian, I don't, do you have anything else? Yeah, well, I would just add that you know, we acknowledged after the uh, forum on October 23rd that there was still some work to be done about what, um, how that informed policy and what sort of de policy decisions we were going to make. So, uh, Mary Ann, you know, came up with the idea initially, and I, I think it's great that we really do need to think about what are those community values, what are those policies that then can inform something like uh, our participation on the task force. I guess the one other thing that I didn't say that I did mention in the proposal is that uh, we're operating on this unsustainable deficit. The police department is uh, ma the major uh, source of our expenses for the general fund. And presumably, as we look at the next year's budgets, unless we're starting to see a dramatic <coughs> increase in income, we're going to have to be looking at decreasing expenses. And that clearly is going to be in the mix. How do you feel that this that this does work into the budget discussion? Because it's my understanding that Melissa has every intention of bringing a budget um, sometime, a preliminary budget sometime in July. <clears throat> um, I thought it was August, but it'll be okay. earlier than you had it last year. Mm -hmm. I guess I would see it as doing the sort of the philosophy part and then going down into the budget. And we have a fair amount of data, you know, from mm -hmm. those forums to mm -hmm. start with. You know, and we didn't put all those documents in here, but I think it would be good for us all to review those. Um, and then I think one thing that's really important is uh, Patty and the Chief's willingness to help uh, sort of focus that discussion and, and think about what we might look at. How do you, um, 
this topic seems to be probably the most active on social media. And since we've got a social media project going on right now, how do, do you see that playing a role at all? Hmm. Um, I hadn't thought about that at this point. Are, what are you thinking about? Well, I guess what I'm asking is, is um, you know, of all of the things we're examining, is that is that going to? It's not not necessarily that we're going to um, that we're going to use social media as a as an information gathering tool ourselves, but are we going to use what is in social media currently, or and will likely be um, as informing this discussion? Hmm. I had not. I mean, I won't like Brian. I hadn't thought of it. I was thinking of using the meetings that we've had and what's been in, what the articles that have been in the paper, um, the survey that the newspaper is doing, and if other if people come to Brian or me who have ideas of what how they would like to see this done or information that they would like to see, and I have some people that I know that I would want to talk to, that we would take whatever comes. So what, you're imagining us just having a kind of a big uh, sort of gathering all this information and having a sort of general policy discussion about the police? I think. And I, then possibly one more focused on yeah, base task I guess force? I, I mean, I don't have, I haven't gone beyond this. Right. Because it so will take said, some thinking to, mm -hmm. to think about how to talk about what we can talk, I mean, right. what we can impact. <clears throat> but you said that potential dates for the discussion could be the second council meeting in June or in July. In June. And, and so you would expect it in general to be a more, a broader discussion than yeah. what you had originally thought. Yes, and not just about whether or not we want to be in the drug task force. Have, have, task have, force right. have we had any discussions about this, the work session, the June work session? Has anything no. already been decided? So. Uh -uh. So, okay. Okay. Well, well, we, so that we was, assumed we would still be on sidewalks, but we didn't specifically say that, no. So, I mean, I'm, I, I mean, I would be looking at you two, really, if you two are heading up this, I assume that what you're planning on is goes beyond just this document that you're going to be coordinating yeah. and gathering, helping to gather the information. So I would just look to you two um, to basically make that determination yourselves. Mm -hmm. Which meeting, what meeting have we discussed Canceling uh, August. August. Yeah, August, the first, first meeting in August. August. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah. I, I, well, I think we should make the, the goal of doing it in June um, because then we have some time, uh, you know, to kind of feed the budget, into the budget yeah. process. Mm -hmm. So we'll make it happen. Okay. <laughs> Council, Jerry, are you in so agreement? We, Lori? Yeah, see what mm -hmm. they come up with. Yep, okay. sure. Any comments from citizens, staff? Dave, any comments? Okay. I'll be there. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so we will um, we will add this to, and Judy, would you please put that on future agenda <coughs> items so we don't lose it? I'm doing it now. Thank you. Uh, next, we have um, solid waste contract information that uh, Patty has been working on. Um, I have Happy been birthday. working Thanks. on this. I've been working with uh, okay. Tom Dietrich from um, the Environmental Commission, and I did also see the email letter from Tom Clevenger, and I met with Dana Stortz today, um, who is Say who she, oh, yeah. with the Greene County Solid Waste District, um, and had never been to Williams. Yeah. Huh. But um, these are several of the suggestions that have come from various residents through, you know, once we um, had noticed that we were going to be putting this out to bid. Um, currently, Rumpke comes through the village four days a week. Um, the question, one of the questions that was raised is, can we reduce the number of days that Rumpke is in the village, and thereby reduce the number of truck trips? Um, so they're here four days a week. They have one regular trash truck and one recycling truck each day that they're in the village. So I looked at the possibility of reducing the truck trips, and, and the reason that that primarily will not work um, 
is because uh, they pick up the trash on Xenia and Dayton Street, Xenia Avenue and Dayton Street on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They empty the public trash cans on those streets three days a week. So it'd be very difficult to reduce it um, by more than one day. Uh, in addition to that, in speaking with um, Dana today, she indicated that she really didn't think that that was a major concern and that um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, with them coming four days a week, we have the ability if somebody gets missed for them to pick that person up the next day. Uh, additionally, her, as you can, her feeling was the same as mine about they would have to come with a pretty large truck or bring two trucks in order to pick everything up. And Yellow Springs likes to recycle, so they would probably need two recycling trucks and two regular trash trucks. So even if you're reducing the number of days they're in town, you're not reducing the number of truck trips because you're just increasing the number of trucks. So um, another truck was, another suggestion was to have uh, the trucks have the idle stop function where if you put it in a park um, to get out and empty a can, it shuts itself off. Um, those aren't very prevalent yet. Um, they're very expensive, and while we could put that in as a, an option or a preference, I doubt that we would get any bids that actually had that in it. Mm -hmm. um, a, third si a third suggestion was um, to institute cur curbside composting, and this actually came from Tom Dietrich on uh, the Environmental Commission, um, because there are other municipalities in the area that are starting to do it, like Fairborn does it. They have the option of it, and we could phase this in as put it in as an option and maybe phase it in, or put it in as an option with uh, allowing the resident to choose the additional cost if they choose to do that. Um, Dana had a concern about it um, primarily because um, some of the issues that some of the facilities in the local area have been having with the EPA. So she wasn't real comfortable with that particular option, and I think in Tom Clevenger's letter, he actually said that was not a good yeah. option. Mm -hmm. um, I would really love to change the rate structure because that is like the most complicated rate structure I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> what I would like to do is um, try to change it to, um, I would like to look at trying to get each um, customer in the village, not only a recycling <coughs> waste hauler, but a regular waste hauler as part of the contract and have it be a flat rate for the waste hauler, the recycle, and one additional can per week and do away with the tiers. And if you really have to go over it, you can buy the sticker or something like that. But I, I, I really think that complicated rate structure um, needs to be changed. Dana did agree with this, but she did also tell me that that structure was actually pared down from something that was much larger when it was written the last time. <laughs> it was. So, um, you know, I, I would like to look into changing that rate structure and try to get a flat rate for everybody in the village that, uh, for instance, um, and I, I hate to keep going back to Williamsburg, but you could put out 10 cans or bags for the same rate as the person who put out one. Well, so. see, I like, I like Tom Clevenger's idea that we actually incentivize people to reduce the amount of waste they're producing mm -hmm. and potentially incentivize them to recycle more. Right. I, I think that's really the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how easy, I don't know how difficult. Yeah. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I only take my can out prob probably once a, once a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I would have to take my recycle can out every week. I could go without taking my regular trash can out for a week, but I would have to take my recycle well, but I, I was thinking maybe, would there be a way that, because um, basically I'd be comfortable with somebody like Tom or maybe, um, you know, Tom's letter with, um, somebody from Environmental mm -hmm. Commission, maybe Marianne or a, a member, mm -hmm. um, just kind of working it out. And right. I think whatever they, whatever yeah. you guys came up with, I'd be happy yeah. to accept rather than even really debating it okay. in this policy. I think yeah. we're pretty clear what this village wants. And mm -hmm. I would say emphasize reduction 
and emphasize and incentivize overall reduction, emphasize and incentivize recycling over um, landfilling, and um, local, if you're going to do composting, we should figure out a way to do it locally rather than paying and carbon carbonating yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. to ship compost right. yeah. across the country. Yeah, I have been working with Tom Dietrich on the Environmental Commission right. on this. And Dana did ask me to make known that, the, that Green County does have two compost lots. They have one for leaves and grass and one for brush. Mm -hmm. So you can take your leaves and grass to one and your brush to the other. You and there are also them. some private Eco, the place down on Dayton Yellow Springs right. Road <coughs> also eco, takes eco it for free. Eco or something. Eco, right. Yeah. So um, those are other options for, and, for folks. And Tom Clevenger said he would be happy to work on right. this. So mm -hmm. I, yeah. yeah. And I mean, the Tom one. And Tom, maybe. The one suggestion that Tom Clevenger had that I don't think is, is realistic is that we, that we bring um, the solid right. waste back inside right. the village again mm -hmm. a, a, to have a, a solid waste department. I don't see that happening, but I do wonder, and I don't know that it needs to happen with this, but um, Antioch College is doing some, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of recycling, and I'm wondering if there are ways, if we should at least consult with them mm -hmm. to find out what they're doing and if there are ways to partner on things. Um, I, Dan and I actually talked about that today and what Antioch is doing is they're, they're actually separating out the, as they go. Okay. And um, she did not think that that was um, a good option for residential um, strict, simply because right now it's going into one truck and it's going to a facility where they separate it out and they're, they're doing everything right there on site. And most households don't um, have the ability to separate it out, so they would have to have a truck for this and a truck for that. And so um, we did actually talk about that today. But with the composting, I think, I think campus and what they're doing with their food and the farm, that might be, mm -hmm. the composting might be something. You know, is there a way to create some kind of a small industry, local industry, out of what they're doing? It's, you know, I, and I don't know that that's a staff thing. Again, maybe that's a discussion that Environmental Commission could begin with them. So then, I guess this would come back to us after, like, as a sort of draft. Uh, once I get the RFP. The then. RFP. Okay. I think we don't need to see it yeah. before that time. Patty, I just have one question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, and that, and, and I hear you talk about, you know, you can take your, your leaves or your brush to different places and so forth, mm -hmm. okay? But I'm just looking at a comparison of Yellow Springs and Troutwood. Mm -hmm. Now, the folks in Troutwood, they they bag up uh, grass clippings. Mm -hmm. they, they bag up leaves. They may set four or five bags out, and Rumpley comes along with the regular trash truck, and they throw those bags in, and, mm -hmm. and they go pay a buck for the bag, and they throw it in. Mm -hmm. They're gonna charge me two dollars and fifty cent for a bag. Mm -hmm. And then they say, oh, by the way, we're only going to pick up that bag at a certain time, and we're going to take it to supposed to be a recycling place. And but here you got a much larger community that they're dumping everything in to the main truck and taking it to a landfill. So what is the difference between the leaves and my two dollar and fifty cent bag versus another community that can buy their bag any place and you know and 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 I looked at their their rates and mm -hmm. <laughs> their rates really are better than the rate that I'm paying. Mm -hmm. But they can throw more junk in it. Mm -hmm. And so I you know I I, I just I, you know I, I have a problem with you know with you know it looks like to me that Yellow Springs is being kind of penalized for being so conscious. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? Well, so, yeah. yeah. And, and um, actually, one of the things that um, that Dan and I did talk about was the possibility of buying some of the um, uniform composting bins 
and making them available to residents at, a, at, the, at cost so that they could do composting on their property in these compost bins. Um, I, don't, I, I had one when I was in Milford that I actually got from the Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, and they're just a standard little compost bin and you put stuff in the top and mix it and it comes out the bottom and you put it on your flower beds. So, um, I mean, that was something that we talked about being able to do here, so. Okay. Um, so, so maybe when you come back with your, with the RFP, would, you, you can address, that, in that can, can yes. address some of Jerry's concerns. Yes. Yeah, I, I definitely, because, I mean, I, I like how Lori, you know, had the idea of let's articulate our goals, and then mm -hmm. I guess what Tom seems to be saying here is don't complicate it with too many detailed right. things. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's because fine, as long as they understand right. our strategy. Because I think some of the things are, they're feel good, but they really don't accomplish what they're, what right. they're intended to do. Right. If right. we're not lowering greenhouse gases, right. we're not improving the environment, we shouldn't do it. Right. Right. Um, okay, next item on the agenda, and oh, when will that, when do you expect this to be back? Um, I would like to bid it out um, in mid-June, so you should have it back at the June, first meeting okay. in June. Okay, okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is community solar discussion planning. Um, I'm not actually sure who's leading that discussion. I would assume Mary Ann. All right. Uh, or <laughs> I thought I was. Patty, oh, Patty, oh, I'm sorry. Patty, if you're I, ready. Yeah. Oh, Patty, you're ready. I, yeah, I, uh, I actually have been doing some research on different financing options, and I sent emails to both Wyandotte, Michigan, and Berea, Kentucky, uh, both of which have municipal solar. Um, Wyandotte actually answered me. I asked them if we could come for site visits, if we could have a, a contingent come up for site visits, and um, Wyandotte has answered that they would be happy to, to, uh, to host us and show us their facility. They do have a PPA uh, power purchase agreement with, um, I cannot think of which company, but it's a 20, 20 year PPA. Um, but a lot of their part of it was um, constructed with federal dollars, federal grant dollars. Um, Nova Consultants is who they have. Um, Berea has not yet contacted me, but um, I'm hoping that uh, they will also invite us for a site visit. Um, and I thought the appropriate way to pay for this would be out of my travel and training dollars. <laughs> that council has set aside for me um, to go to the ICMA conference, which is all the way across the country in Seattle this fall. So I probably would not attend. And so we could use the funding that is set aside for that so that we can take contingents and maybe go do this research on these solar arrays. Um, so. Okay. Okay. Well, well, my thought is that um, the Energy Board has done a lot of research, mm -hmm. both on the community solar as well as issues that need to be changed in our regulations right. and ordinances. Right. And uh, the Energy Board, I don't think, has done s uh, as much research on different kinds of uh, village-owned mm -hmm. or village-owned or leased or whatever. I, I think I I'm, want to suggest that the Energy Board work with staff mm -hmm. to look at the different options. Uh, it's possible that we could have a community solar like the uh, Energy Board has been looking at as well as a village wide or I, I don't know I, but uh, given that uh, we I think we need to pull together the different sources of expertise that we have on staff and on the energy board and work to see what makes sense and then come back to council with a report I think it would be good to have somebody in the energy board if you take a trip to this to yeah. have somebody on the yeah. energy board at least one person yeah I, yeah I would leave it up to council for the I mean I would like to include Johnny and myself mm -hmm. um, but um, other than that it would be up to council who else would would attend I mean they're both within a day's drive so it's Wyandotte is, is a Detroit suburb so it's not I mean, it's I, not too far yeah and I would, I would ask that we not lose sight of the, uh, 
the AMP project that John Courtney Correct. mentioned because I think that there is some validity to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do we really have the capacity um, in right. any number of ways to take it on ourselves? Right, and that's um, that was one of the things I looked at today was the different methods of financing where the utility can finance it. Um, you can do a PPA with another, you know, with a, a private contractor. Um, there are all different. There are th several different ways to do it. So, and and this needs to be, you know, we're we're all working for the same um, for the same goal, mm -hmm. and um, that is to reduce our carbon footprint to bring some alternative energy. So I think it needs to be an inclusive, a broad and inclusive discussion. Um, of those groups, so I would, um, I would, and, and, and then bringing in council in the community, so I'm excited about it, mm -hmm. especially since it's so sexy. You know, <laughs> I read that today, I actually read that today, where um, one of the uh, websites said, yes, solar energy is sexy, and I went, oh my gosh, they it's actually said that. <laughs> So okay. I'd like to uh, well, oh. hear from the audience, especially people from the Energy Board. Yeah. Um, so, so we have actually, you know, for the past six, seven months, gone through all these different options. Um, it'd be great to do all of them. Uh, it'd be nice to proceed along the lines of at least doing the one that the Energy Board recommended because we do have the tax um, incentive going away. Um, village owned and PPAs are both great options. Um, we did try to do that years ago with the glass farm and took a, a very long time to do it and it fell through. So just mm -hmm. be aware of history and the difficulties they're in because this is a big project if you're gonna go those directions. Right. It's relatively easy to allow people to own their own panels somewhere else because the village is not responsible for that part. It just has to set the, the uh, facilitate it. So, I mean, as I've pre mm -hmm. presented multiple times before, um, I would encourage you to actually make forward progress. Thanks. Okay. Rick Walkie, Energy Board. Uh, just like to reiterate kind of what Dan said and what we've talked about. I think the uh, the community solar project that we've been here so many times for is one that we can do now. We already have um, the capacity in our uh, given ordinance structures to to do that today, um, and because the financing opportunities are going to slip away, it's important for that reason. The, um, the second part, which is the, the PPAs and the AMP projects and stuff, these are also good projects and we can probably uh, work them in in the future. We have, um, as you noticed in the John Courtney's presentation last week, uh, our portfolio is, is changing. Um, there's going to be room in the near future for some um, more peaking uh, resources, something that um, solar would give us. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages to think about it in those terms. Um, we wouldn't have to think about it as being part of that 1% uh, or 5% cap that we've imposed on ourselves. It could be part of our uh, the larger um, portfolio of, of um, resources that the village maintains. So I think we should probably move in both directions. Um, but the sooner we, sh we start on the community solar uh, ordinance, I think the better. And be thinking about how we want to move on the, uh, mm -hmm. the larger uh, uh, the solar project that we may own or you know, bring someone else in. Okay. Um, thanks, Rick. Rick. Thank you. I'd like to ask you. So if mm -hmm. we were to move on the I'll say the private community solar project. As what are the next steps that that you think need to happen, and what's the time frame that you think for the for the non-community solar for the no private, no no for the, for the pri for what private oh, for okay. what energy board okay. has recommended? Uh, I, I think that uh, 
the probably the best thing we need to do is uh, uh, rewrite the ordinance that so that it would be allowable and and also clean it up for uh, all, the, <coughs> all the inconsistencies that it currently mm -hmm. uh, has. So I would think that uh, this rewrite could probably be a process involving staff and the Energy Board and uh, John Courtney. Uh, a collaboration between the three of those groups would probably come up with a, a good piece of legislation that would make this all happen. So the only thing that would be needed is for us to update that ordinance? There are, there are procedural <coughs> things that need to change as well. Uh, there's going to be, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've talked about the permitting process. There's some there's some loopholes and yeah. uh, but that would be part of that the ordinance plus the permitting. The, yeah, the what we would have to do if, if council chooses to move forward is um, that we would we would need a new ordinance that allows the um, virtual net meeting. Virtual net meeting. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, we'd also have to change some of the other language and procedures in there. But I mean, there's there's actually quite a bit to clean up in that ordinance. I mean, once you start really looking at it. But um, anyway, just for this project or in general? <clears throat> in general, there's a lot to clean up, but there's a lot that's also related to this project. I think we can all agree that needs to be cleaned up. I mean, yeah, there, there's a fair amount of the ordinance that there oversights that need to be fixed that, that are problems with the way the ordinance is right now. And then there's about three or four different things that have to be added to allow the virtual net metering and to define what you know community solar as we presented it to the, the council um, is. Is the intention to cite it in the village? The intent, it has to be you know, within the ability to live by the very nature of what we were so where exactly it's cited is the, the, the intention of how the Energy Board discussed this and, and recommended to Council is that it, it's depending on the installer developer as to where exactly it goes. And it could be anything from a solar canopy if the village wanted to, to rent out the parking uh, area over across from Peaches to uh, the side of the roof of Tom's. If, uh, if the Masons want to rent out that roof to the uh, solar canopy over Antioch's parking lot, you know, wherever, and it doesn't have to be just one large installation, it could be multiple smaller. And if we change this legislation, if, if the changes in this legislation happen, does council and, and village staff have any other involvement with this project? I mean, is it, does it have to go through zoning, John? I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm interested as to what sure. the interface is and if this is just something that can happen with. Well, no, it, it, it's, it's no different than any other installation except that it's not on somebody's roof. So you still have to have all the permitting and everything else that has to go through Patty with all the permitting as far as capacity and everything else that, that um, the, the, the present solar, if you put it on your roof, it's just located some other place. As far as the actual cost of it, and John listed a bunch of different things, the cons on the, the, the personally owned, those, you, you can sort of think of it as uh, like a cable company kind of setup is that there'll be an installer developer that will have to come up with a price per kilowatt installed, and that's what they're going to have to try to get people to sign up for, and they're going to have to sign up before this even happens. You know, you and it has to be enough people to be worthwhile for the, the people doing it. Um, so, I I would like Johnny to to do you have anything you want to say, Johnny? And I would also especially like you to address the um, question of Dan just said one large or multiple small arrays. So can you address it from your point of view, please? Well, there, well there's two things that come right off the bat. Um, the community solar does take it from somebody's own property from behind the meter and sends it to, now we're hearing multiple areas 
over the village possibly instead of just one localized area uh, but the other thing it does is it will be the only meter in town that is in front of the utilities we have none of that in the village Antioch is behind the village uh, if somebody produces power on their property it's behind the meter now they're wanting to change that to where it's in front of the meter to where they basically are selling us the power we're buying it from them uh, dpnl is who we buy it from so the other thing that i i, I have trouble with is, is and i'm not against the solar I, i've not been against it since i got hired here is this ordinance to my understanding was brought in 2012 2013 we're trying to change it in 2015 to accommodate a community solar. We're getting ready to go over the hydros where a lot of people are not thinking about solar, not thinking about conserving energy, not thinking about other alternatives. And if we let the community solar go like the energy board proposing, then they have to go to a private sector because they're gonna take up the rest of the remaining for the houses and you can't put it on your house no more. So they'll have to go to the community solar because they will have it basically locked up the rest of the interconnection that the council has proposed. That's incorrect. The only way that, as we proposed and talked to Patty about this, the only way that, that a community solar project can operate with the proposed ordinance is that if you have a particular, so we, if Patty wants to put it on her house, but her house is shaded, and she used 3,000 kilowatts last year, she can participate as part of the community solar project for that 3,000 kilowatts. The community solar developer cannot develop any more solar than people have already committed to. But you understand what I'm saying is that they can't, you, you can't, because they are not, they are not users in the village, mm -hmm. they cannot ask for, if they, if they, if they ask for a larger amount of, of, of solar, how do you turn it down? But in, in the discussion that I had with, with Rick, um, there was kind of a feeling that getting someone to build a community solar array for less than a hundred and what, what did you say, Rick? A hundred thousand watts. Yeah, right. I, I think we need, we need to, we need to do what Marianne suggested, mm -hmm. have the two groups work together and bring it back to council. I still do have a lot of questions. I think that I want to understand if we, how we can do both. I want to understand, is there room for other, for other private solar. Um, I mean, I really want to get down, and, and I know you guys have said you've presented it, but it's, there needs to be some meeting of the minds at some place. There needs to be some kind of agreement. There needs to be some kind of give and take. You know, we're, we're, we're not accustomed to totally ignoring our staff. So, we've got staff that's not supporting this project so if you guys are supporting it you're going to have to figure out how to work with staff and how, how to communicate and how to bring it back to council in a way that we can we can understand it and support it and i'd like to point out that neither johnny or i is is opposed to solar i mean we both agree that solar is not only a good idea but a necessary idea he, we just both have concerns about community solar, the, the virtual net metering. Johnny, I know, has some safety issues that maybe we can discuss and, and come to resolutions about. But, you know, it's... It doesn't make sense to have these arguments in a council meeting. They need to be in these, these discussions and this tension in a council meeting. It's got to be worked out and it's got to be brought back as well, a joint proposal. I think probably what needs to happen, though, is there probably does need to be a council right. per person. Right, well, Mary, the, yes. But, the, well, but there also needs to be council directors. If you want to, yeah. if you want well, to that's what we're saying. So I, I'm going to suggest that the direction be to clarify. So there are some distinctions being made. Let's decide, are these distinctions legitimate? What are they? And then if, if 
if staff and the energy board do not agree, let's really tighten up the differences so that it can come to council and council can understand exactly what the difference is and weigh in on it. Because I don't, I don't think there's that understanding. At, at this point, we've already had it. Dan, we can, have it. Listen, listen we've you know, told you what we want you to do. Can, can, can we have a little order? You know, we normally don't have debates back and forth between, you know, so, you know, I, I know, Dan, you're emotional about it and so forth. Well, but, no, I just spent yeah, a lot of time. Yeah, but, but anyway. Okay. We're, you know, that, Marianne is going to lead this, I think, that working with staff and energy no, I, board. I think, yeah, I think that we can do it. I'm not sure that we'll come to agreement, but I, I think at least that we can clarify exactly what the disagreement is and clarify uh, some, some, some disagreement is, can be figured out that maybe it isn't a disagreement and some clear, some, there's some policy disagreement, I think, that the, the only other point, you know, Patty had, had suggested taking a trip, mm -hmm. but I s still, and, and I don't know if you were asking for approval to, to take the trip or. I can fund it out of my budget. Okay, I just, but, you know, council will, you know, we need to decide who's going to go, but okay. that can be a decision yeah, that Marianne you know, I want I, you to, energy to I mean, it, complete yeah. that yeah. portion of it. It feels to me that we can wait a little bit on that, that that, may, that trip yeah. may not be a I priority. I think we need an up and down for the, for the energy board. They deserve it, and the time is running short on that. So we really, we need to get to a point where we can have a kind of, yes, we're going to support this, or no, we're not. So we don't keep wasting their time. Yeah, but I still, I, you know, because one of the, the proposals that the, the energy board did bring forward was a public owned solar, okay? And they kind of didn't look at that direction because they thought there was an issue of budget and financing. Now we find from what Patty and Johnny looked into that that may be an option. So I, I to me, I don't know how we can make a decision on one with I, that with that option being available, unless we're going to decide we're going to have two. That's you know, I, I you know, unfortunately, right. it's coming in at the eleventh hour, but it sounds like an option that may be viable. Well, so. I, I suspect that uh, it can be determined whether or not that there can be two. My suspicion is there can be two, that there can be a, we'll say, private community solar, as the Energy Board has been working on, as well as some kind of village, and there are different options for the village. The private is something that could probably get going quickly. I mean, it has to get going quickly in order to take care, take advantage of the tax credit. Mm -hmm. The larger village thing is going to be a longer term thing. So I think if, if the Energy Board can, and, and then if staff can agree that, yeah, that this can move forward, that both could happen, then I think a council could, can give a go ahead. Could we be sure to get John Courtney's um, PowerPoint on the community solar that he mm -hmm. gave us in electronic format? Because I've been looking for it, and I don't think that part came huh. did through. He, did he send that to you? He sent it, didn't he? I thought I was it's it's a while ago. Is it online? Okay. Yeah. Oh, for the last meeting. For the, the special meeting. I thought I only week. got that in. Uh, okay. Let me. Let me. I. I probably didn't. Didn't. Uh, didn't look closely enough. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, are we ready to move on? Yes. Uh, next, our manager. The manager report. Um, I'm going to let Johnny go over the loop completion progress first so that he can uh, head home. So. The loop completion from the water towers to the curve at Herman is complete. They did the final connection uh, today. Uh, so they've got to go from what is the Pelzell's rental property to Zing Avenue. And they'll start working on that tomorrow. Um, they did close down Date or Corey between Dayton and Zinia. Uh, they had uh, some of Chief's officers directing traffic. 
uh, they got two foot and hit solid rock at four foot down for 80 feet. So they have a quite a big hammer coming in tomorrow. But they didn't stop. I, I will give them that. They didn't stop. They dug out all the dirt, and then they found out that the rock ended 80 feet, and they kept on digging. They went back to Cincinnati and got plates and plated it all up. So mm -hmm. what you see have plates. There's only 80 foot that they can't put on pipe. So by 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, they should be laying pipe. Their goal is to get across 68 by Friday. And nice. then they will come back and do the dig-ins for the buildings. And I have talked to all the business owners, uh, made them aware of that. Uh, there was some confusion about the Livermore water shut down. Uh, they was wanting to cut in a, a T there. Uh, There's some confusion. We talked to Antioch. We talked to a couple of the uh, radio station. Uh, the daycare was notified. Uh, don't know where the, don't know where all the residents fell into that because the, they was never affected. So I did post last night on Facebook that that was canceled, postponed. Mm -hmm. I did talk to the the daycare this morning, and told her that we would give her three days notice prior to any water shutdowns. Uh, and some of the other citizens were concerned that, you know, we was maybe only using Facebook. And I said, no, we're using Facebook. And if you're affected, we will directly talk to you. Mm -hmm. So. Everything's going as well as can be expected at this time. Johnny, so. when uh, when we say get across 68 by Friday, does that mean Corey is open again? That means that they will have a restoration crew come back in the next week and do the black topping after they get all the taps done. Okay. Uh, my crew uh, Friday and today found the 10 inch line that John Eastman told us was there but didn't know where. Uh, of course, they dug up. We found a six-inch line, no 10-inch line, so now we have a missing 10-inch line. <laughs> Luckily, we found an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper in the archive files that somebody did in 1977, and it had exact measurements is the only way we found it. Off of the main water valve in Xenia, we hydro-excavated the place where they're gonna tap onto today Mm -hmm. And so they was able to order the parts. And mm -hmm. and so. somebody is making drawings or somebody. <laughs> they are the records. We, I had this conversation <laughs> with Scott. Uh, daily they update their drawings and weekly they get a new set printed off for them at the wow. end of it. That's nice. We will have it all done. My guys are taking a locator out there that we purchased and actually landed on there and marking it with the. Uh, and can GPS. this be shared with RCAP? Doesn't RCAP have? They our do system. Have, they do have our system, and I'm going to try to get with them, or if not with John, because our power poles are on the same system now. It's GPS, okay. So we can get a larger map of the infrastructure. Perfect. Thanks for following uh, up with the uh, Montessori school, by the way. Not a problem. Let me clarify one thing with the meters. To go back to this whole meter thing, uh, the electric meters will do nothing except maybe a little bit more accuracy but it will free up Dan to be able to read water monthly. Yeah. It will not do nothing with the water. I got a price on water meters today, and I think I'm gonna start buying them one at a time as we need them to where it already comes with software and we just replace them one at a time versus coming back and saying, hey, I need a half a million more dollars. I mean, that'd be nice, but we can't do it all in one year. Mm -hmm. So, but the electric meters will do, it will free Dan and Brian right. at church up to why they're reading the water meet water meters every month they won't have to walk and try to find the electric it uh, it'll just jump under their handhelds great okay, okay. thanks johnny thank you johnny thanks for being thanks. here tonight <clears throat> um in addition to that johnny and his crew have started replacing the poles uh that did not pass inspection go home Hi. <laughs> um so um they will be working on that Soil borings are complete uh, for the new site, for the new water plant. Uh, everything was fine. It will support the, the building, so we will be moving forward with that. Uh, the Home Inc. Um, open house was uh, last Friday. Uh, they will be, it's my understanding that Durst Brothers will be doing the restoration on Cemetery Street this week. So uh, they were not up there uh, as of like lunchtime today, but um, they should be up there this week. The new library roof will be going on in mid-May, weather permitting.
pool passes are on sale. There is no price increase, but everyone needs to know that we will be enforcing the requirement to have your pool pass on you this year. Um, if you do not have your pass, you will be required to pay the daily rate um, to get in. And we did go back to the little ones that you just pin onto your suit. So it's not like you have to carry a big pass. You can just pin it onto your suit and leave it there and you'll be ready to go. Um, the passes will only be sold at the Bryan Center. We have extended the hours. Um, I don't know if the flyer made it in there. Oh, it was it. in last week's, but I don't didn't see it in this mm -hmm. this time. Um, and that is it for me. The dispatch thing. Uh, we, do we already? I yes, guess we've already, we already discussed that. Okay, that. okay, that's it. Thanks. Okay, John. Uh, yeah, so my report basically, um, a lot of my report had happened earlier uh, with the zoning map amendment and the uh, second reading on the permit fee revisions. And the uh, We did um, the North College, East North College Street, uh, street Vacation uh, is proceeding. We're working on drafting up the legal description and the agreement, uh, and then we'll present that to uh, Antioch College. And uh, once we have uh, indications that that will be uh, moving forward, we will bring that to you guys to uh, with legislation for vacating that uh, part of uh, North College Street. Um, as for Herman Street, that will be going back to the Planning Commission in May. Uh, Jason Hamby, Reggie Stratton, and myself, uh, we, we met last week regarding the uh, Herman Street vacation and seem to have gotten all the uh, concerns from staff addressed. So uh, that will be moving, uh, that will be presented again at our May Planning Commission meeting. Uh, and then we introduced our ICMA fellows earlier in the meeting, and I'm continuing to work on the sidewalk uh, report. We've gotten some pretty significant numbers today, so uh, the bulk of, of my report, seem, the, the, the bulk of the new numbers of my report, I think, are, are beginning to come together. Everything else is uh, proceeding with that as well, and uh, that's about it. Any questions? Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. Judy? Um, my report is basically it's just still busy in the clerk's office, lots of citizen involvement on a number of different levels, um, and then a few extra meetings here and there have just made things keep clicking along. Babette is almost almost done replacing the pages in the bound ordinance book, so just a reminder oh. to council, if you've got I a book, bring it in because um, I know what mine is exactly. Um, sorry, Chris, I should have said something to you before you... There you go. Um, yeah, you'll have to put your coffee on something else for a couple of days. Um, and then we've got the, the draft agenda for Monday the 18th, if you wanted to address that at all. Yeah, the reason um, I asked the draft to be given to council ahead of time was um, because especially since the legislation that we decided that we were going to do hit on that same meeting, what I wanted to be able to do was to set an agenda for the work session to kind of prioritize that agenda because so that we can follow that agenda um, going forward, um, which is why we added things like petitions and communications and citizens' concerns because it felt to me as if we shouldn't go an entire month without those things, announcements, that the normal things we do at, at at, uh, at council meetings. Mm -hmm. And then we had also talked to the retreat about, you know, that standing reports were kind of a logical um, extension or a logical piece to include in the, in the work session. So, so we wanted to set that. Um, given the importance and the, the public interest and the um, utility um, legislation, it seemed like it made sense to put that first in the agenda, prioritize that. We're allowing an hour, so it should, it should give us plenty of time for discussion. We have two additional pieces of legislation, but those um, don't seem to be eliciting much discussion. Um, so I would think that that hour um, would be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Would we start the work session early? I, I mean, if we potentially could. I, I don't expect it. I mean. You know, if it's 15 minutes early, then we would take, you know, I would just take, a, maybe take a break, five minute break by the time we get back yeah. together, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't expect it to be that much earlier. Um, okay. I don't know what everybody no, else think thinks. Um, 
So um, I guess just for, for that meeting, which is the most important, I just want to make sure that everybody's on board and everybody's okay with that. Actually, it's kind of nice to have the actual draft agenda to look at. We'll talk about, well, I'll, <clears throat> I'll work with Judy on doing that. Maybe we can do that more, more often. Yeah, um, I mean, if it's not a problem, but if it is, obviously. Right. Um, so then um, <coughs> charter review report, that will be ready, Brian, for the next meeting, or for the first meeting on, G on June 1st. Yes. <coughs> um, the next two items, um, I think, are just kind of on hold. They're there for hold. So we're looking at the tax budget in July, but that's just the pro forma, right, mm -hmm. that we have to do for the auditor. That's correct. Um, the ACE task force should be taken off or should be moved to right. June, yeah. A policing. Right, yeah. And we added that in June, and right? It, was that to be a work session? Yes. Work session, work yes. Session. The second yes. meeting. Yes. So it'll be the second meeting. Um, you know, we've got it. We we should probably have um, solar. I don't know if I want to call it community solar. Uh, I don't know how it, what I what we want to call it, but we should have that as a placeholder because that's obviously going to be on our agenda. Well, it should be on as soon as. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse soon, me. Yeah. Um, when's your next energy board meeting? Tomorrow. Um, no, it's not the next week. It's it's the week oh, yeah, after twelve. Yeah. But you know, maybe after maybe at the work session, you could come back with you could let us know maybe is because we'll we'll need to do agenda planning obviously at the work session. You mean at our eighteenth? Yeah, at the eighteenth, uh -huh. maybe you could give us some idea of yes. when you'll be ready to come back. Yeah. Um, anything else that we can recall that needs to be on the agenda? Okay. Um, I would appreciate a, um, I guess the only, oh. the, uh, the <laughs> environmental commission will be coming back with some things that council requested, um, regarding the climate action plan. Okay. okay. And, and Patty, when, um, so you, June 1, is that going to be solid waste? Um, it'll be the first meeting in June, whenever that is. Yeah, yeah. June 1st. That's what I'm shooting for. I mean, there's a little play in that schedule. The contract doesn't expire until August 31st. So um, as long as I <coughs> have the, the bids back by the 1st of August, um, I want to bid it for four weeks. Right. I don't want to bid any longer than that. Um, as I said last time, Patty's uh, first anniversary is coming up, so that means we need to figure out a, 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 the annual review process. And uh, so I don't know if we want to discuss that in, uh, I think, maybe a little discussion in open session about right. how um, we're going to proceed would be good. So then, so, But I don't think it would be a long one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing I guess we need a placeholder for is the uh, commission ordinance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when when are you if thinking? we can do that on June, June 1st that would be good but I guess you know we can see which pieces um, so now we're looking at you know the actual ordinance with you know all the parts the that standardized piece. yeah the second piece yeah okay. All right. okay. <clears throat> um, so can I get a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussion of the clerk's performance and contract terms. I so move. Second. Okay, Wintrow. Yes. Askman. Yes. Sims. Yes. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Take a five minute break. Yes, yes. please.